I would like to welcome you in this session of our conference and uh, thank you for being with us. I will make some introductory remarks and I choose to try to touch a rather controversial issue in order to attract some kind of discussion. For this reason, I consider the session as a key one by discussing the future of energy system across the planet. And this is because the question of the future of oil and gas demand globally needs a careful and realistic approach. There are two factors shaping the energy picture in the years to come. The climate crisis and the energy transition on one hand, and the increase in energy demand around the globe on the other. Amid these two factors, we need to consider the role of the fossil fuels and especially that of the gas. Clean energy is the most dynamic aspect of global energy investment and certainly the type of energy we need to overcome the climate crisis, the today's severe energy dependencies, and because of that, the related geopolitical tensions. On the other hand, the oil and gas industry are a critical component of the global energy, energy mix, accounting for, for approximately 60% of the world's energy consumption today. Oil is the most widely used fuel in the world, accounting for around 33 of the global energy consumption. It is used in a variety of industries, including transportation, heating and cooling, and electricity generation. Gas is also an important fuel, accounting for around 24% of the world's energy consumption. It is used primarily for electric generation and heating, but also in transportation and industrial processes. According to the ExxonMobil's global outlook, oil and natural gas are still projected to meet more than half, in particular 54%, of the world's energy needs in 2050. <coughs> Especially natural gas use is projected to increase by more than 20% by 2050, given its utility as a reliable and lower emission source of fuel for electricity generation, hydrogen production, and heating for both industrial processes and buildings. Based also on BP's estimates, oil demand declines over the outlook, driven by falling use in road transport. Even so, oil continues to play a major role in the global energy system for the next 15 to 20 years. The prospects of natural gas depend on the speed of the energy transition with increasing demand in emerging economies as they grow. Analyzing the market trends, we understand that large companies, the non-governmental ones, do not see an end to oil demand any time in, in the near future. To this end, both Chevron and ExxonMobil are proceeding to acquire oil and gas companies paying tens of billions of dollars. Continued demand for oil and gas, despite growing momentum in clean energy, is due to population growth around the globe, and in particular, due to growth in populations ascending the socioeconomic ladder in Africa, Asia, and to some extent, Latin America. Certainly, the oil and gas industry face significant challenges in terms of environmental concerns related to greenhouse gas emissions. The industry is exploring ways to reduce its environmental impact through technological innovation, including carbon capture sto and storage and improvements in energy efficiency. Another challenge for the industry is the volatility of energy prices. The price of oil in particular can fluctuate significantly due to, the, to factors such as geopolitical tensions, especially in our nowadays, production levels and global demand. On the other hand, in October 2023, the IEA released its annual energy outlook report that projects 
global demand for coal, oil, and natural gas will hit an all-time high by 2030. The transition to clean energy is happening worldwide and is unstoppable. It is not a question of if, it is just a matter of how soon, says the IEA's Executive Director, Fatih Birol. But the how soon is not also without difficulties. Clean energy projects are facing headwinds in some markets from cost inflation, supply chain bottlenecks, higher borrowing costs, and shortage of grids and storage infrastructure. Especially in emerging economies marked by, by, by population and economic expansion, the adoption of low carbon energy sources may be prohibitively expensive. Taking all the above into account, certainly we need to move steadily and decisively towards the clean energy. But oil and gas are here, especially that of gas. Is here in order to supply energy when there is uncertainty about the pace of energy transition, to give solutions where the technology of clean energy cannot, and at the end, to fill the gaps for a long, long period of time. So having said that, I would like to thank you once more for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, I'm going to call to the podium our friend and colleague, Johan, for his introductory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the session I like, it, I like it most because of natural gas. Although natural gas is a kind of fossil fuel, it is one of the cleanest fuel among fossil fuels and should be supported against coal and oil. And I think we will benefit for many years. At the INE meetings in 2007 and in the following years, our discussions on natural gas were centered on who would win the gas race in Nabucco, ITGI, TAP, TANAP, and South Stream projects. It was not possible to realize all of the projects. The source countries were Azerbaijan, the Russian Federation, and Iran. In the following years, Israel experts started to participate in the meetings as a natural gas source country. Among these projects, TANAP and TAP deliver Azerbaijani gas to the countries of the region, and later Bulgaria was added to the project as IGB pipeline. The South Stream project was also changed as Turkish Stream and started to supply natural gas to the countries in the region. When the shale gas revolution in USA which started to develop in those years, combined with the development of LNG liquefaction and ship technology, and studies revealed that the positive effects of American LNG on the American economy and unemployment prevention would be more than the effect of rising domestic market prices. US LNG started to enter the world market since 2016. The development of FSRU technology also enabled LNG to become widespread. US LNG has globalized natural gas trade, which was only regional with pipelines, leading to price, ad price advantages and resource diversity. Natural gas trade was no longer a regional, but a global trade. The dependence of natural gas prices on oil decreased and gas started to compete with gas. However, the de development of global gas trade also led to the direct impact of global problems on this trade. On 24 February 2022, Russian President Putin launched the invasion of Ukraine. 
Two years have passed since the war of in Ukraine. It is not clear whether the war will end anytime soon. The risk of war in the Far East, which is gradually increasing, the increasing tension in the Gulf, the Iran-Israel standoff, Israel-Palestine problems, although they have not yet had a significant impact on the LNG market except Russian-Ukraine war, always carry a potential danger. All these effects affect the budget of a household or an industrialist in Turkey and in Greece, even they don't have nothing to do with it. On the other hand, it is suggested that World LNG production will increase in 2025-2026, and it is recommended not to rush for a long-term contract. Another view is that new LNG projects are needed after 2030 because the world's demand for natural gas will continue to increase from 2030 to 2040. And since there are no projects under construction to be commissioned after 2030, they think that it is a good policy to, to tie up supply opportunities now and sign long-term LNG purchase agreements. I believe that the pause imposed by US President Biden on the export of US LNG before the presidential election referring environmental policies will be lifted after the elections. Otherwise, electricity generation from coal which causes twice as much carbon emissions as natural gas will not stop. Moreover, in this process, natural gas can be mixed with hydrogen when necessary, contributing to even less greenhouse gas emissions. Large and small-scale LNG plays a pivotal role in the transition of green energy. I am sure one of the speakers today will say something about this interesting subject. We know that not only LNG, but also Azerbaijan wants to supply more ga natural gas to the market through pipelines as a reliable country in Europe's natural gas supply. They are working hard on this issue. I'm sure that today a valuable speaker from Sokar will say something about Azerbaijani plans. At the same time, Botash had their plans about natural gas ex export activities to Balkan countries. In addition, Turkey is trying to bring a new opportunities for investors by amending the natural gas law to allow FLNG exports. Perhaps if we take into account the domestic natural gas produced in the Black Sea and the recent positive developments in Greece and green energy, we can see Turkey as a potential player in LNG exports as well as natural gas exports via pipeline. We will also uh, see the Mr. Uh, Tomadakis, our good friends from Desva, will say something about the, I'm sure, uh, something about the Desva's plan for connecting the pipelines. So now uh, the floor is for the speakers. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much. Uh, you brought up some interesting points, and I hope that we are going to have um, enough time to discuss about uh, this. We are going to listen uh, first all the speakers, and then we are going to have a discussion uh, with questions, etc. So, um, our next speaker is um, Mikhail Tomadakis. Uh, Mikhail Tomadakis currently serves as the Strategy and Development Chief Officer of DESVA. Michalis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, for the invitation and uh, the introduction, uh, and Mr. Stavolis and his colleagues for this very interesting initiative. Uh, it was something missing. Uh, Greece and Turkey are long living together, so we have to continue working together. And I think it's a great opportunity uh, which uh, uh, Desfa is willing to support. So please go on. <coughs> and uh, thanks to Mr. Uh, to, to Johan 
uh, <laughs> I will take the, the, let's say, the challenge and speak about what we plan to do in Greece. Well, first of all, allow me to introduce Vespa. Um, okay. Uh, Vespa uh, is a gas TSO, as we say, uh, is the owner and operator and developer of the Greek uh, national uh, gas grid, including the LNG terminal of Revithusa. There are other uh, uh, gas uh, TSOs, as we call them, uh, gas operators in Greece, uh, private ones. Vespa is the only one who has an obligation for third-party access uh, operating uh, the system since uh, its, uh, let's say, construction some 24, no, 28 years ago. Now, Vespa in 20, uh, 2018 uh, was acquired, uh, well, it was first close to be acquired by Socar, to be honest. Uh, we had this discussion earlier. Uh, but uh, finally, it was acquired in 2018 uh, by three of the biggest companies, uh, similar TSOs in uh, Europe, SNAM, uh, Enagas, and Fluxis, uh, from Italy, Spain, and uh, Belgium, correspondingly. And uh, it has become a private entity, still, of public service. Uh, to be clear, Vespa does not buy nor sell gas. We just import it, transport it, and export it, and deliver it to the final consumers or to the neighboring network. So we are not a trader of gas. We are facilitating trading of gas, as I hope I will show you. <clears throat> we have a very rigorous, uh, as we call it, 10-year development plan. We are expanding uh, the network. You see in the... Uh, I'm not quite sure if I can show you somehow. Uh, you see the dotted lines on the map. The, the, the solid green line is the existing high-pressure network. Uh, the solid, the, the dotted red lines are the, the current expansions of the system. Uh, number one is uh, the pipeline that is under construction right now will be delivered next year. Uh, that brings gas to the decarbonite in the region in Greece where lignite plants are decommissioning. Uh, number two uh, is the future expansion to the western uh, Greece, which is also under construction. Um, number three is the under construction again, uh, inter new interconnector from Greece to North Macedonia, which is simultaneously built on both sides of the border. It will be in position to, to send up to three BCM of gas northward, so th through North Macedonia, even uh, northern than North Macedonia. Uh, number four, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, is our new truck loading facility, LNG facilities on the island of Revithusa. Revithusa is our, uh, let's say, the, 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 <coughs> the jewel of the crown, I will show you in a minute, our LNG terminal. Um, and uh, we have now uh, an operating uh, truck loading facility of LNG on this island, uh, a, a rapidly expanding activity service. And we are also building now, uh, and will be ready by the end of next year, a, a jetty which will allow bunkering vessels to bring uh, LNG to, to vessels that are uh, willing to change fuel. Uh, then we have uh, the FSRU of Alexandrupolis. Uh, I think next week we'll start its official operation. Uh, the second LNG terminal in, in Greece, which is a floating unit in which Desfa has a 20% stake. Uh, we participate in the Hellenic uh, Energy Exchange, I will show you in a minute. We have a 7% there. Uh, and this is something we, have, we are very proud. We are developing a, a gas trading platform there. Of course, you know all about the interconnection Greece-Bulgaria, uh, a pipeline that has started operating since October 22 and is doing well. Uh, the trans adriatic pipeline was widely mentioned. Uh, it operates since 2020, and it goes very well, although it can be better. Uh, I'll explain it towards the end. And we don't have uh, an underground gas storage, uh, which has failed to be developed in Greece. Probably now it is not uh, needed. We have an, onshore, an offshore potential facility, uh, which is called South Kavala. You see it under number nine. 
and this has recently been part of the hydrogen, potential hydrogen storage facilities of Europe. <coughs> and this is Revithusa. Revithusa, you can see it is located uh, in an island called Salamis, near Athens. Um, of course, it was some 3,000 years ago when the, the, the naval battle between the, the Greek and the Persian fleet um, made Persians leave, well, for hundred, hundreds of years, uh, the, the, the European territory. It was there where the, <laughs> this naval battle took place. But anyway, now we have uh, in this small islet, islet close to, to Salamina, uh, which is called Revithusa, uh, a terminal with uh, 225,000 cubic meters of storage tank. Of course, compared to the Turkish facilities, this is very small, uh, but it gives you a, a, a size of what it is. It can send out up to uh, 5 BCM per year in normal uh, gasification capacity and can accommodate the biggest vessels, LNG vessels in the globe, Humax. Uh, by the way, I'm not referring to this, but Desfa is also operating the third biggest LNG terminal in the world in Kuwait, Kipik, uh, which has eight, si eight times the size of Revithusa Island. <coughs> now, the capacity of Revithusa Island is booked through auctions. So anyone, every July, uh, no, now it's every September, late September, can come and book capacity in Revithusa for the next 15 years. So every September or late September, early October, um, traders can come uh, in the auctions DESFA is, uh, is organizing and book capacity. You see here, this is the, these are the results of the latest auction that was performed in October 23. We have booked capacity very much interest. You see 24, 25, and 26 we have <clears throat> more than 60%, uh, uh, let's say, of the technical capacity already booked long-term uh, by shippers, not only from Greece, but also from abroad. Uh, from 27 onwards, uh, the interest uh, be becomes lower, and after 29, we, heard, we had no interest for the first time, but we'll see, because we are also pursuing uh, with, uh, 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 let's say, with something I will show you <laughs> later on and uh, uh, was already somehow introduced. As I said, we, are we, are, we have a 7% seven, seven stake uh, at uh, the Hellenic uh, uh, Energy Exchange, uh, which started operating its trading, gas trading platform since 2021. Uh, you see the results of the last year auctions. Uh, uh, OTC um, and uh, 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 trading platform auctions uh, on a monthly basis, and also the, the churn ratio. This th is for 22, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> these numbers increase, but volatility in this power trading platform uh, has been increasing, and especially since Desfa is now in position to buy gas from the trading for the platform for balancing purposes. So it was allowed by the regulator, the Greek regulator, uh, it was permitted to, uh, to Desfa to go and buy gas from the trading platform, thus creating uh, liquidity in the platform itself. Having talked about uh, what is happening in Greece, I'm going to say a few words and <laughs> also to fulfill uh, the prophecy and I'm going, that I'm going to say about that. Uh, this is what is called Vertical Corridor Initiative. The Vertical Corridor Initiative, which actually started quite a few years ago, but due to the invasion in Ukraine that was described by Johan pre uh, previously, uh, all the TSOs of the countries you see, uh, we entered last year into an MOU. So it's, uh, of course, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Hungary, and Slovakia, we have entered into an MOU that we are going to do the following, which is currently underway. We are going to perform on all interconnection points, as you call, we call them. It's all the blue circles you see on the map. We are going to per perform simultaneously a market test. So, interested part, uh, we have uh, worked together 
We have defined, uh, we have launched uh, the market test last summer uh, under the, the, what is called uh, capacity allocation mechanism network code of the European Union. So last summer, uh, uh, there was the, the non-binding expression of interest from all uh, traders around the region, all entities around this region. Um, and we then sat together and we defined what are the projects that need to be built to accommodate the requests of capacity on all those interconnection points. And we are about to launch, <coughs> I think it will be May, uh, probably, yes, in two weeks' time, uh, we are going to launch a binding test a simultaneous binding test for all the dotted points you see on the map. There are, I urge you, for those who are interested, uh, well, I can also send to you the, the, the corresponding link, uh, links, but you, I urge you to go, because all this information is public information, you can go to the websites of the corresponding TSOs, point, uh, interconnection point by interconnection point, and find out uh, what is needed to participate. So the market test will be simultaneously launched on all points uh, in May. Uh, we will give two months time. Uh, and in July, we are going to receive the binding offers for the, for the market. And then we are going to perform um, what is called the economic test simultaneously, all of us, uh, to find out what are the projects the market can pay for. And those projects are going to be contracted uh, by September 24. And of course, start the, the process for constructing them. We are all very optimistic. And let's see what will happen. <laughs> now, <clears throat> uh, specifically for Greece, uh, since we had also interest uh, not only for the interconnection uh, points, so the blue dotted lines you see on the map, we had also interest for the new, uh, let's say, advertised new developments, the new FSRUs. Uh, we have four more FSRUs that are interested to take place in the market. Uh, starting from the south, it is the, uh, the Origa FSRU, uh, it is the Argo FSRU in, in uh, central Greece, and also the Elpedison FSRU, and a second FSRU of Gastrade. Gastrade is the company that operates the FSRU in the north. Uh, there has been also interest expressed in uh, those points, so we put also those points in our market test, in our part of the market test, so whoever wants to have capacity in all these points and simultaneously capacity for exports or uh, imports, and of course you see a dotted play. <laughs> one of the dots on the map is Kipi and, uh, point, okay, so this is the famous interconnection between Greece and Turkey, which remains idle, more or less, uh, for the last uh, five to six years, unfortunately, but has started a very interesting trade. Uh, there is also the possibility for someone to book capacity at that point, entry capacity, and you see it there, keep is an entry point here. Uh, so I urge you, if you wish, I can send to you any information you like, uh, to, to, to have a look, and if you're interested to uh, <laughs> import gas to Greece, please do. Now, uh, having said what we uh, are doing for gas, allow me to tell you how we are thinking of addressing the future. Of course, as was described uh, uh, by Mr. Dimas, gas is a challenge as, as a fossil fuel. Uh, natural gas is challenged as a fossil fuel, but there are other molecules and of course, we strongly believe in this far that we can have no uh, uh, transition without transmission, as we say. So uh, let me tell you what we do about that. <coughs> you may have heard about uh, the, the European hydrogen backbones. Uh, mostly are those arrows you see on the map uh, that had been have been developed uh, by a working group for th the last three years that will bring uh, 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 hydrogen from all the areas you see, so North Africa, uh, North Sea, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Northeast, uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast uh, Mediterranean, uh, and Europe. We are trying to develop 
the Greek part of the map, let's put it that way. So uh, we have assessed the market, and you see in the circle that is focusing on Greece, uh, we have identified for the time being, but we are going to do it on a yearly basis, who is planning to export gas, to, to, to produce hydrogen. You see the, 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 the green dots, and who is going, who is asking to consume hydrogen in Greece, and we have developed the, the, the Hellenic, the Greek hydrogen backbone, the, the uh, uh, green line on the map, uh, and we have submitted this in the process that is called PCI list, so Project of Common Interest of the European Union, and we, we were very ha uh, happy to see that our project, this project, is the first one that enters the PCI list, entered the PCI list last December, as a hydrogen backbone for Greece starting the market from Greece. Uh, we are heavily working on that to make it happen. It's a joint effort of Greece and Bulgaria, and this joint effort has been also joined by all the TSOs of the North. So we have now what is called uh, Southeast Europe Hydrogen Initiative. Um, so more or less all the TSOs you saw in the vertical corridor, plus those of Germany, have, we have all signed an MOU to develop a, a hydrogen backbone that goes from Greece to Germany. And this most probably will be in the next PCI list, because all projects will enter uh, this initiative. But we don't stop to hydrogen. We are also working for carbon capture and storage. We have also submitted to the same process that's called PCI, uh, Project of Common Interest in Europe, uh, a project called PRINOS. The idea is to, uh, to, to uh, aggregate uh, carbon, so CO2 emissions, from emitters you see around uh, Athens, collect them all to the uh, triangle, the green triangle you see on the right-hand side, which is Revithusa, liquefy CO2 using LNG power, transported by vessels to Prinos, which is uh, here. It's the only producing oil producing area in Greece. And this is called Prinos CO2 project, and we are working to make it happen. Uh, we have already received uh, all these dots on the map, and us, as a project, we have received more than 600 million from the European uh, grants, develop uh, this infrastructure, and we are asking for more. I'm going to stop uh, with what we do, and uh, uh, just say what we consider as challenges ahead. And this is my last slide, so that I let others also speak. Uh, I think that the biggest challenge that a gas TSO and the gas industry is facing <coughs> is how to tackle with ill-designed way of introducing renewables in the system. And let me explain myself. It is, there is no doubt that renewables is the future. Renewable ways of producing energy is the future. However, very early on deployment of uh, renewables without taking into account the needs of the systems and uh, uh, the needs for the security of supply and also uh, affordability may lead to risks. And I think that this is one of the most important things one has to think over. And all the countries have to be very careful on how to introduce renewables in the mixture, especially when there is lack of sufficient energy storage and how to tackle with the issue of energy storage. To my opinion and our analysis, uh, batteries are not the only solution, probably not the... <coughs> they have to be accommodated with uh, molecule storage. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, there is a big, a big risk for gas infrastructures that uh, comes from national plans. Uh, the, these plans are aggressive, sometimes very aggressive, and have to be consistent with reality. And this is, I think, one of the biggest project, uh, uh, challenges a gas industry faces. For the regional uh, market, and uh, certainly this is one of the challenges we face in, risk, uh, in Greece. Uh, uh, there is always the need uh, for clarity regarding EU policy, which is an issue. And of course, energy interconnections and access to them remain very critical. 
and will increase even more, especially in the electricity, in the power sector, because there it is where the biggest challenge will exist for coordination among energy markets. And I'm finishing with that, Turkey and Greece. Of course, we have, <laughs> as I said earlier, we have an interconnection point that remains idle, more or less. We take some very few quantities from uh, both, I mean, not we, but uh, Greek uh, uh, importers, some very small quantities of botas due to the old contract. And this seems to remain idle for the, for the immediate future. Something could be done there. I, I strongly believe that there is a possibility uh, <clears throat> to exploit the existence of this point. And of course, exploit the existence of TAP. I, it's the, the third time I say that in Istanbul. Uh, <laughs> TAP can work backwards. And uh, Turkey has a direct link to the second biggest market of Europe, Italian. So uh, TAP can work virtually on a spot basis free. So I'm um, finishing here, perhaps some food for thought. Thank you very much. We thank Mr. Thomadakis for a comprehensive presentation of DESFA. Um, you have raised a lot of issues and possibly we are going to have the opportunity to discuss about that. Now uh, we are moving to our next speaker, um, Mr. Serkan Hotoglu, board member and general manager of ONV Turkey. You have the floor. Here is my presentation. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this forum. Thank you so much for the invitation. Especially, it's really unique opportunity to becoming a participant of such a forum for the first time because it's the first uh, energy forum between Greece and Turkey. <clears throat> Until now, we have listened to all the regulatory authorities and also, you know, some you know, regulatory makers or some TSOs. Now we are trying to, I'm, I will try to compose a picture what can be the opportunities between two countries and from a commercial mindset. And that's why I put the title of my presentation, Importance of Turkey for the Supply Security, because you know it's part of the energy trilemma and energy transition within the region. Yes, there are lots of ideas about energy transition. Solar power, wind, hydrogen, those are the final destinations. But still, gas is the most convenient low carbon solution for fuel transition if you look at, this, uh, if you look at the higher carbon fuel use of the countries. And I think this one, yeah. And a uh, couple of minutes also, it's mentioned, you know, Turkey has the biggest consumption within the region. Those are the 2022 numbers. In 23, there are some decreases within the consumption. But if you look at the region, you know, Romania, I tried to focus on connecting countries, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, and Turkey. Turkey is consuming 75% of the region. And except one country, which is located at the very north of this map, three of those countries are not balanced in terms of supply, because they do not have, they are not, they do not have 100 percent their own supply, uh, which is essential to consider, because you know merging the capacities and merging the capabilities can help. This is the message. This is the message that we can take away today from this slide. If you look at Turkey, Turkey has, you know, we have some, how do you say, Murat Bey is here and he's really working hard for the capacities on behalf of Botash. And we have five LNG access points and two underground storages with 5.8 BCM capacity. And last week we were in Ankara and we take the surprise that we will be increasing the capacities to something above 6.5 BCM levels. 
And roughly, imagine that Turkey is, has the capability to have an access to 500 million cubic meter per day. This is quite unique, 500 million cubic meter per day. Because I think uh, 10 years or ago, I was in London and we were listening with, uh, with Mr. Murat Marjan, I guess we, we were part of a delegation and to see how the transition for becoming a trading hub has happened at those regions. And we were communicated that there has to be a capacity. There has to be an excess capacity to ensure the flexibility for the market participants. That's why I'm really proud of the capacity we have reached as Turkey to reach 500 million cubic meters per day above. No, that will give the flexibility for the rest of the region. This is the another you know, technical perspective and also concluding uh, what I said a couple of minutes ago, 500 million, couple of seconds ago, 500 million cubic meter is the target. That, you know, we need to consider from the technical mindset, having different entry points, having 500 million cubic meter of technical capacity is quite an asset because the difference of gas you know, gas is a vertically integrated business because of having an access to technical uh, limitations. This is the only concern that I guess uh, regarding to, you know, region and also regarding uh, the demand in the region, Turkey manage a lot to provide such a background for any potential cooperation or for any potential trading hub uh, in the future. Besides that, there is a big recovery. I think we really need to also put in part of our minds uh, the gas uh, exploration activities at the Black Sea region. You know, European uh, continental is not so rich in access to indigenous gas production, but for sure with the uh, greener world targets, you know, low carbon emission targets, Yes, gas demand projections are showing, to, uh, showing very low uh, and decreasing uh, gradually. But on the other hand, still the region is not sufficient in terms of having an access to their own indigenous production. But if you look at these promising numbers, despite the promising numbers, the region can reach up to 20% uh, of the regional demand at the plateau value when the Black Sea gas uh, has reached the plateau production value. This is quite an amount. This is quite an amount and we need to consider about how we can tackle within the region and uh, with this indigenous gas. And after touching that point, this is a unique capability within Turkey. I am also chairman of liquefied and compressed natural gas association. And Turkey was one of the uh, innovative moves of Turkey to start small scale LNG business at the beginning of year 2003, year 2004. Botash was also so supportive, the private sector too, providing an access to LNG terminals. And we also established the truck loading facility in Marmara, Ereglis, I think, in 2000. There was already there, but it was not proper enough to support the growth of the small-scale LNG business. Then with the participation of the private sector and Botash, we invested for 75 trucks per day loading capacity and still is in use. And we do also have a gigas LNG terminal. There is also 75 trucks per day capacity. And that helps us to uh, develop the small scale LNG business. How it works, you know, uh, Turkey is a very wide geography. And for sure, it's not so feasible to access everywhere with the pipeline. That's why there are some geographical uh, places, uh, you know, via truck, you can carry the small scale LNG to, to unreached points, underserved areas. If you look at the Turkish market, approximately there are 250 LNG trailers in operation. It's quite a number. And Turkey is second biggest small scale LNG market all over Europe after Spain. And around 3,000 locations uh, supplied by truck within Turkey 
this, this is, you know, small scale becoming the enabler for having an access, letting access to energy for underserved areas. How it's look like, you know, a picture tells more than a thousand words just to help you. This is an immediate solution, comfortable and immediate solution. The message here, Turkey is very well uh, experienced because, you know, the most expensive, less expensive, but most valuable thing is the experience. Turkey has quite an experience, more than a decade, for small-scale LNG business, even for marine LNG operations. Those are the capabilities. In addition to the technical capabilities of the pipeline, Turkey is a gas country, having a unique experience, expertise. To come to the point, you know, we talk about the capabilities because it's the bottleneck of having, uh, realizing some cooperations. I think Turkey is ready with the technical capability and with the uh, bunch of access points, number of LNG terminals, FSRU access, you know, to provide some unique opportunities within the region. What can be, you know, this, you know, from the, because the purpose of this forum to also when we talk with Gökhan Bey to discuss about the potential cooperation opportunities. That's why, you know, you know, within the, with the help of those pictures provided to you, please try to imagine that, you know, when the things are set, there can be easily physical deliveries. There can be easily volume swaps. This helps you to save from the higher transportation costs or higher efforts, and also seasonal swaps. Because, you know, you, if you look at the countries, you know, so, you know yes, they are on the same, uh, how do you say, meridians, but some longitudes and, you know, some seasonal changes. That's why some seasonal swaps can also help to utilize the assets, because gas assets are so valuable. I think countries within the region also take into consideration how to utilize the already existing assets in today's economy. Besides that, I also strongly believe in the role of small-scale LNG. That's also part of the purpose why I intro introduced you the capabilities of Turkey in terms of small-scale LNG. Yes, natural gas is a transition fuel. And if you look at barring business and the mobility for heavy-duty trucks, you know, they are nearly uh, releasing more than 10% of the carbon emissions Heavy, I mean, you know, in total, more than 25% of the emissions by transportation, but you know, this marine business and also heavy duty trucks are nearly 13 to 15, 13 percent level, approximately. I think we can find a way to manage this transition because yes, hydrogen is the final destination, but it will take time. But other than that, there's still a quick win, quick move for everyone to use this unique LNG expertise here in Turkey. I hope my message is uh, placed well for the uh, audience. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Those are my contact numbers. If you are interested in any time, you can keep in touch. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Um, you brought here uh, a touch uh, of uh, the real market, and I took note uh, about your approach uh, for the cooperation in the area. This is uh, a very good approach. Now, um, I'm presenting to you our next speaker, who is the head of commercial Sokar Turkiye, Mr. Ahmed Polatkan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me express my gratitude to uh, being among these uh, distinguished panelists and the audience. Um, actually, my presentation will be, uh, I think, shorter than expected because planned, because most of the slides have already been mentioned, I think, so I will try not to waste your time. Uh, let me give you a short introduction in, in a nutshell uh, information about SOCAR Turkey. We are the uh, biggest integrated uh, 
industrial holding of Turkey, we have already invested $18 billion, and the total investment amount is expected to reach $19.5 billion soon. And uh, directly or indirectly, we are employing more than 10,000 people in Turkey. In my presentation, I would like to give you a picture about uh, Turkish gas market and uh, where we are. Are we close to be a hub or not? And what are the uh, potential cooperation opportunities in the future if uh, we achieve? So in a global perspective, which is already mentioned many times before myself uh, by the previous speakers, but according to many studies, IEAs, Reichstadt or others, in the reference cases or in the base case scenarios, it is very apparent that the golden age of gas is not over, so the consumption and the demand is there. Unless we uh, globally uh, took really ambitious uh, attempts and reached net zero targets. Uh, also, th this slide gives us, I, I really like this slide, uh, it's a McKinsey study, it shows us the big picture. Uh, whatever we are talking about trade globally is only 30% of the volumes because the 70% is almost uh, consumed where it is produced. So whatever we are talking about trade globally is just 30% and it, it's, it's going to be the case uh, for a very long time, even in, even in 2050 we, you see the uh, percentage is 63. And pipeline gas still dominating uh, of course, it will change, uh, you know, in the uh, direction of LNG. LNG trade will take over, but pipeline trade is keep, will keep and keeps its significant uh, position in the global trade. Of course, there are financial and geographic reasons behind it, but also it's important for the buyers' uh, supply security and sustainability. Okay, uh, in order to be a gas hub, we all know what all the steps. Uh, easy to say, but hard to achieve. Uh, you know, third party access, bilateral trace, price transparency, OTC brokering, and the first steps are mainly physical, and the remaining parts uh, are mainly financial, as uh, Mr. Taha mentioned in his presentation. Uh, Epiash is uh, very eager to reach to this financial products. And also there are some hubs, there are some statistics about hubs in the Europe, especially TTF and NBP are leading and there are certain, of course, elements there, but mainly the active market participants and the number of products there are huge compared to what we have here now and the churn rate is significantly high. And also the markets are, as we all know, changing from uh, evolving towards the hub indexation from oil indexation. This is the uh, EFET gas hub uh, benchmarking study. So uh, unfortunately, Turkey's uh, position is now 14th, but, uh, and the scores are decreasing a bit in the last years. Uh, but to be honest, uh, let's not be so pessimistic because as we all know, in the last couple of years, the markets were extremely volatile, the prices have skyrocketed, and there was a reflex from the governments to protect the customers. And then, you know, the liberalization and the market dynamics become the second priority for the state. So, but yes, uh, I would like to skip to the uh, positive part. So uh, it is already mentioned, but we reached almost 500 million uh, cubic meter daily capacity in Turkey. If um, Ratbe, if the numbers don't add, add up, please accept my apologies. You know, it's really hard to catch what we are achieving. It's increasing every day, maybe every week. So it's really hard. We have a significant amount of uh, storage capacity, infrastructure, is the most important part of being a gas hub, because without it, you know, you cannot deliver anything. So this is the, you know, pipeline part, the infrastructure part is there. The, how to say, more virtual or how to call, uh, the exchange part is there, you know, actually the virtual and physical infrastructure is there. This is a, I think, uh, 
good slide where you know shows uh, this is an illustration of the gray line is the um, an illustration of Turkey's uh, monthly gas demands, and as you, ca as you can see in the green line, the entry capacity of Turkey is reached really you know sufficient amounts to reach the peak. I think 280 is the maximum what we have seen so far. <laughs> 90, 290, okay. So I think 500 is uh, good enough to uh, manage the system and uh, secure the supply security, to reach the supply security. So Turkey has uh, actually in a turning point in 2026, majority of gas supply contracts are ending. So this will be an important step there will be a decision, of course, from the state, the energy ministry, how to handle this process. Is it going to be privatized or not? Or maybe renewed for how long, shorter, in what terms, oil indexed or hub indexed? But 2026 will be important. Uh, Mr. Taha gave a lot of statistics about APH gas exchange, so I think I can skip that part, but there is significant amount of uh, developments here and uh, trade. So remember this, this slide, please. You know, it was just in the beginning. I think the, the, there are developments, as I mentioned. You can see the pro process. I think we are fine with the physical part, as Mr. Taha said, but we will have um, a development area in the financial part, like non-physical players enter we have a futures exchange, but it's not working now, so we should make it working in a better uh, way. So to conclude, actually, uh, in order to be a hub or increase the cooperation between your neighbors, you know, first of all, the in, uh, interconnection infrastructure should be there, and your infrastructure should be physically uh, healthy enough to carry volumes east to west, west to east, north to west, whatever direction it should go. Second, uh, it is also very clear that you have to unbundle your incumbent, which is Botash in this case. But one thing I would like to express here and underline, because it is sometimes confusing. In order to be a hub, you don't have to privatize all your contracts. Botash can still play the majority market player there. It's, it's, it's not an obstacle against. But unbundling it is a must. Uh, so I want to underline this because those two issues sometimes uh, confusing. But of course, not that level. The third, uh, the third title is to uh, private sector, of course, should be a part of it maybe more than today's levels, but as, again, Botash can, be the, can lead the majority part. It's, it's, not, an, again, it's not a thing that, uh, that will prevent being a gas hub. But of course, uh, we need to quit uh, price interventions. It is also you know, uh, a must do thing, and to end the subsidies, to uh, change the system, evolve it to subsidize somehow defining the vulnerable customers in the market. We all know that uh, Tur Turkey and Ankara is working really hard on this and uh, everybody is aware of what should be done. But there are different ways to achieve this. So it will be the states and the ministry's decision to manage uh, how to do it and in which way. And we are too close because we have everything here and we have a roadmap and it is very clear uh, that what sh should be done. So in the coming future, there is no reason uh, to be a gas hub here in Turkey and to connect, increase the interconnection capacities with our neighbors, including Greek market, and increase the trading opportunities. Thank you very much. We thank you also. Um, I realized uh, uh, how prominent is the position of uh, Shokar in, uh, uh, in the market here. 
and um, uh, thank you, thank you for the broad picture that uh, you have given to us concerning the, uh, the operation of Gas Hub. Okay, now, um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have our next speaker with us. Uh, he will not be able to join us due to the last minute uh, rescheduling of uh, operational procedures within his company and on. And now, I think that we must proceed to some kind of discussion, questions. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, over there. Sorry, I seem to be asking all the questions today. Um, I have a, a question for... Um, sorry, I've lost it. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Tomadakis, um, you mentioned that there was a uh, big uh, potential for cross-border trade at Kipi uh, and that the cross-border connection currently isn't being used or is very being used very little. I, I wonder what was the reason for it not being um, fully employed currently? Uh, this uh, this uh, entry point, or well, the capacity there is something like 4.5 million cubic meters a day. <coughs> Uh, this was a, well, first of all, it greatly depends on the upstream pressure, and upstream pressure is the Turkish one. According to the, the existing, inter no, which has expired long time ago, interconnection agreement, I was about to say, uh, the upstream pressure was 50. If, if it can be more, the capacity can be more than 5 or 6 million cubic meters a day. Now we are using something less than 1, well, sorry, 0 0.1. Because the, there was only one contract to be served there between uh, Botas and Depa, which has expired. Uh, and for the time being, in the auctions, because we perform yearly auctions at this point, so every July, you know, the, th the first Tuesday of each July, VESPA is performing according to the, what we call uh, European Network Code, uh, calendar, we are performing auctions in all our interconnection points, including the one with Turkey. Uh, nobody has declared any seri serious interest. So it seems that there is a difficulty for Greek traders to find Turkish sellers, let's say. This, this seems to be the main point of concern. I mean, I think this is the main reason, that there is no, let's say, ability between buyers and sellers to get Turkish gas to flow to Greece. This is the, the, the reason. Uh, OK, OK, yes. So, Mr. Tomodakis again. You mentioned several times that the new pipelines will be hydrogen ready, all of them. What does it mean exactly? Is it? Uh, Dedicated? Are they dedicated? No, no. They are built, all the dotted pipelines I've shown on the map, so four pipelines at this stage, are hydrogen pipelines built under hydrogen regulations. But since there is no hydrogen, they are used temporarily for natural gas. Now, how much temporarily, we'll find out. But this is what I mean, hydrogen ready. We have also assessed the rest of our system. It can accommodate up to 20% hydrogen with any need for, with no need for, for any trans transformation. Uh, there are parts of our network, uh, the existing network, which is uh, actually, um, I showed in one of my slides, one of the youngest in Europe. Uh, the, they can be transposed into hydrogen, 100% hydrogen transportation with no, no, no transformation in the steel of the pipelines. We may need to change of course, we need to do something with the compressors if the, the, the need comes, or with the flanges, you know, where you have to, because the pressure has to be a bit higher. But in, in theory, we don't need to do much. Now, we need, of course, a lot of hydrogen to do that, and for the time being, uh, <laughs> this is missing, but okay. What about the, the one we just discussed, the one starting at Kipi? Uh, this one, uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure if this, the part, this 80 kilometers, because there is a, after 80 kilometers western of the Kipi border point, it is IGB that starts. 
uh, from this point westwards, uh, this will be 100% hydrogen ready. Eastwards, uh, I think that there is the need to have a joint assessment of both TSOs, I mean, BOTAS and the RAS. Uh, we have not done it, uh, but this is probably the youngest part of our system. So I assume that from the Greek part, it will be also 100% hydro, uh, hydrogen ready. But we need also hydrogen for yourself. Well, I would say let's find gas first, and then we go do something with hydrogen, but yeah. Okay, another question? Okay, uh, I have one for all of you, including Johan. Um, so, to what extent the energy markets are being impacted as a result of the two war zone situation we're currently experiencing in the region? May I start? Uh, I think yeah, there was a there was a uh, there was a, a, a huge impact in the beginning, but now the Greek gas price is in pre-war levels. Uh, I don't believe that the way things are going also in the south. So Ukraine is over. I mean the, the impact of the war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, the war itself is not over, but the impact of the war in Ukraine uh, is over. Uh, I think also the market has, un has absorbed any future expiration of the, 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 the Russian transit contract. There is abundant energy capacity now, uh, any, uh, nowadays in Europe. Uh, so I think the war of Ukraine will not affect any, the, 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 the gas markets any longer. Uh, the South also. I mean, yeah. OMV? Uh, Is it working? Yes, yes, it's working. OK. In terms of gas market, you know, what to expect in the future? You know, I think uh, European Union and Turkey also very well prepared after, especially for Russian Ukrainian war, to hedge their supply sources. That's why it will have a big impact for the supply security in the future. And this was necessary, by the way, because it's the part of it's, the, it's on the top of energy dilemma, supply security, because we are not so rich in terms of having an access to energy, our own energy. That's why we need to be prepared for this. I am also agree with uh, Mr. Tomadakis, and uh, there is a more or less oversupply position within the upcoming couple of years. The gas has separated from oil prices. And I think that my personal opinion, gas will not be a threat in terms of cost for the economies for the upcoming years. With the help of these uh, fundamental investments, you know, this, uh, because there are new LNG investments coming on stream. There are new LNG vessels, especially coming on stream at the second half of the year. Uh, 2024, there are 60 new LNG vessels are coming on stream, which will help the rest of the world to having and better access to liquefied natural gas with better economical conditions. This will give a balance to the markets, I guess. Okay. Uh, Sokar? I think from the supply security perspective, the markets have already proved themselves, I mean, in the region. Uh, maybe thanks to the mild weather as well this year, this winter, but to, today the storage level in Europe is above 55, 56%, which is ready, I mean, and which is above the previous year's averages. Mm -hmm. So from the supply security perspective, apparently there is no problem in Southeast or Europe or in Turkey. Uh, but the prices, I don't believe that will ever go back to COVID levels. You know, due to many reasons, I can say, um, first of all, there's inflation, I mean, in dollar-based. Second, the brand prices, oil prices are not going down. As you know, there are tensions all around the world. <coughs> and third, if we want more investments to come, I mean, in LNG, I mean, in upstream, then the prices should be at a certain level. So from the, the prices will not go back, but there's no supply security for the time being. Okay, thank you. Johan? Uh, for the 
security of supply, I, I have, in my uh, speech, I have almost answered, but uh, there will not be any problems till the, the 2030, but uh, after 2030, how the gas will be supplied, it's a question mark right now. Uh, for the short-time securities uh, of supply, uh, there might be the problem starting from next year for Austria and Hungary, because uh, still uh, their uh, supply, uh, natural gas supply problems, how they are going to be solved, not sure, but this uh, creates uh, opportunities for Turkey and Greece for the supply sources to Hungary and uh, Austria. For the price-wise, uh, I believe that the prices will continue to decline, but not much, maybe uh, around five uh, dollars per mm BTU, not less. Uh, but after 2030, if no new uh, LNG projects be agenda, then again we'll, uh, we may uh, see a shock again. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we have realized that uh, everybody in this session believes how important is the role of natural, especially the natural gas, for the energy security. Okay, uh, we thank you a lot uh, again. A yes. Okay. Thank you very much for allowing me to ask the final question. I would like to ask for uh, Dr. Tomodakis. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation as a TSO, Despa, neither sells nor trades gas. But I just want to ask your opinion about the price formation in Greece. Can you provide some information about the price indexes, the major driving price indexes in a Greek market such as TTF, a comparison of TDF index with oil index. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we, we run, actually, I have a daily report on my desk uh, on the price. Uh, our price is following closely following TTF. Everybody in Greece buys TTF right now. Even the long-term contracts have a 60% uh, TTF uh, index, let's say, linked to them. Uh, if you if you compare the daily price of uh, the Greek uh, Henex price, the Bulgarian price, and TTF, uh, and this is, I think, interesting for everybody, uh, the Greek and Bulgarian prices are very close to each other due to mainly Turk Stream, huh? because Greece, at the end of the day, is importing gas from Turk Stream, and they are, in most of the cases, up to five uh, euros per megawatt hour lower than TTF. So this is more or less, well, for, for as long as I remember from my daily reports. Uh, but uh, I think we are be beyond the oil indexed, uh, indexed pricing. Everybody buys TTF. Okay, uh, another question from there, and the last question from Mr. Gerdim. Hi again, this is Ismail from Botash. So the, I just would like to start, like, the, on the way to come here, we were actually quite exciting. Maybe there was a surprise from the Greek side that they're gonna do some investment on the uh, capacity of the KP side and then the, the development. I mean, the, in the presentations, I didn't see or the regulatory arteries as well. Like there is, they mentioned the ISMED project even, but there is no mentioning anything about the capacity development from okay. the Greek side. So, so, sorry, I did not mention that, uh, my omission. Uh, we are building, actually we are currently duplicating the pipeline from uh, Komotini, Thessaloniki. This will raise the capacity from the Turkish side to the Greek system to, I don't know, Five. Double, double, maybe uh, three times, three times higher. Oh yeah, that's the probably the, uh, so, uh, the, the best news or the. the although we are building the pipeline, <laughs> to be honest, we are building the pipeline to, to provide access to IGB from Revifusa, but uh, I can tell you that uh, well, <laughs> it is certain that the, the the capacity from the east to west, which is now limited, yes, will become abundant. Okay, probably the, our colleague from Sokar is happy to hear this as well. Oh, okay. So <laughs> happy, yeah, okay. 
But they have TAP, though. But TAP can extend to as much quantities as they want. I mean, and just a quick question as well, maybe. For the Kavala, uh, the underground storage capacity. Uh, this is 1 BCM. But uh, this is a painful story in the sense that uh, it will never be developed oh. as, a, as, a, as a gas underground storage. Oh, OK. Thank no. you. Thank okay. you. Yeah, uh, my question to uh, uh, Ahmed Bey, is there going to be uh, expansion in the southern gas corridor? Because everybody is uh, wondering what will happen, uh, what is the Azeri's, uh, Sokar's uh, future uh, plans? Thank you, but if the gas prices will be $5 MMBTU, no. <laughs> <I'm t> <laughs> The most important part is the financing. So somebody should buy, somebody you know should sell. And Southern Gas Corridor is a gigantic project. You know it has its upstream part with different shareholders. In midstream we have SCP, TANAP, and top pipelines with different shareholders again, different counterparties. We have buyers in Turkey and we have buyers in Europe. So it's a huge project. But the most important part is who will commit to buy and who will invest and who will finance. I think there is big ambition uh, from the Azerbaijan side, but of course the buyers and the financiers uh, should be there as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you also. Okay. May, may we have a photo, please? A photo here.